Hi, Dr. Mercurio. Good afternoon. My name is Isha, and I'm a high school student interested in being a veterinarian. I'm so excited to welcome you to the interview series on the careers of veterinarians. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me start with an introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Mercurio. Dr. Mercurio is the owner of City Kitty Veterinary Care for Cats, a feline-only practice in Providence, Rhode Island. Dr. Mercurio graduated from the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine in 2008. She worked at a feline-only practice called the Cat Doctor and Friends in the Los Angeles area before moving to Rhode Island in 2009 and starting at City Kitty, where she had been ever since. Dr. Mercura is married and has two daughters. She also has two handsome kitties named William and Thomas, in addition to a large flock of chickens and some beehives. When not at work, she loves spending time with her family, traveling, and teaching spin classes. With that short introduction, let me extend a warm welcome and thank you to Dr. Mercurio for chatting with me today. Greetings, everybody. Thank you so much, Isha, for that nice introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Dr. Sarah Mercurio, and I'm thrilled to be here speaking with you today about veterinary medicine and my personal journey and experiences both in becoming and being a veterinarian. So first, could you tell us about the type of work that you do? Feel free to use your slides or any visual aids that you want. Absolutely. So a um, little bit about me and what I do. This is the lobby of the feline practice that I now own in the heart of Providence, Rhode Island. As you can see, just from the first couple of pictures, we are not your typical veterinary practice. <laughs> uh, but before I speak about what I currently do, I just wanted to give you a little background information about my, my veterinary medicine journey and how I ended up as a practice owner. So before I got accepted to veterinary school, I really thought I wanted to be a large animal vet. So I decided that I would seek out a local large animal vet and see if he would allow me to ride in his truck with him for a day and see what it was all about. Well, I only needed about an hour or two to decide that large animal medicine was not for me. So I ended up getting a position as a kennel assistant during the summer between or before my uh, final year of undergrad. I just really wanted any experience I could get. And boy, did I get it. I cleaned that entire practice from top to bottom every day. This picture obviously is not actually me, but you get the idea. Even though it was really hard work, I learned that I loved what happened in small animal practice and that it was much more my speed than large animal practice. I found myself especially drawn toward cats. This is a picture of Winslow, who's one of my favorite patients. Um, after graduating with my bachelor's degree from UC Santa Barbara out in California, I decided to take a year to work in an animal hospital and be sure that it was what I really wanted to do. I was hired at that same practice, but this time as a veterinary technician. This was one of the best choices I could have made. Gaining experience as a vet tech has been invaluable to my career. While I was in school at the University of Minnesota, I kept my mind open as to what career path I might wanna take. However, I kept finding myself being drawn to feline medicine. The more I learned, the more I realized that I really wanted to work in a practice that was exclusively feline. So against the advice of some of my professors, I elected to not do an internship, not go into a practice that did both dogs and cats, but to go straight into exclusively feline practice. And I've not regretted it for one second. Feline practice is absolutely wonderful. Cats are complex little creatures and they do not let on that they are sick until they are often critically ill. That's what makes this job so interesting. I've heard many specialists say that uh, general practice is boring, and that is absolutely not true. No two days are alike in general practice, and we get to see and do a little bit of everything. Soft tissue surgery, anesthesia, dentistry, dermatology, oncology, cardiology, neurology, lots of internal medicine, behavior, the list goes on. Here are a few pictures from City Kitty. Um, this is one of our exam rooms, and my associate, Dr. Palmer, is examining a patient with the help of one of our technicians. If you look closely, this kitty has a housemate that's also there for an appointment and decided to jump up on the exam table at the same time to provide moral support to her, her housemate there. Uh, this is a cat neuter in progress. This is myself and Chris, one of our technicians. Uh, here I am cleaning some kitty teeth. You can see the dental radiographs that are displayed on the monitor in the background there. We do a lot of, lot of dentistry and feline practice. This is our x-ray room. Uh, our technicians take the radiographs and then they review them to make sure the images turned out okay before having the doctor come and examine them. So they are taking 
taking the kitty out of the carrier, they've got all of their protective gear on and then looking at the images on the screen. This is our cardiologist doing an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart on one of our patients. He comes every week and does um, ultrasounds of the heart and the abdomen for us. So City Kitty is a bustling practice. We're located right in um, the heart of Providence and one of the more affluent areas. We're lucky that most of our clients are willing and able to allow us to provide the highest level of care for their cats. So I figured uh, maybe I would walk you through what a typical day in our practice looks like. Um, so I arrive around 8 a.m. and immediately get handed a stack of records that have my lab results from patients that I saw the previous day. I start reviewing them and making decisions as to next steps to be recommended, medications to be prescribed, et cetera. During this time, all of our surgical patients are being dropped off, as well as some patients for what we call drop-off appointments. That's a service that we provide in order to be able to see sick cats when we don't have room for our regular appointments in our regular appointment schedule. So those cats get dropped off in the morning and we examine them in between the normal appointments. And then we call the owner, recommend a treatment plan and proceed and then the owner can just pick them up when it's convenient for them that day. So here's a cat getting dropped off and coming on into the practice. Once everyone's dropped off, the technicians um, begin the process of running any pre-surgical blood work that needs to be done on the surgical patients for the day. Uh, so this is a picture of some of our in-house laboratory equipment, and this is Jill, one of our technicians, getting everything set up and starting to run the lab work for the day. Once everything is complete with the lab work, then we begin surgeries. And on an average day, we'll do between two and six surgeries. It's usually two dental procedures and then a combination of spades, neuters, mass removals, cystotomies, which are like bladder stone removals, uh, et cetera, lots of different things that we do. Here's a cat getting its blood drawn, <laughs> oh so calmly. And here's a picture of a cat getting prepared for surgery. This is Kathleen, one of our, our head technician. She uh, is very skilled and can intubate a cat just by herself, which most people struggle with. That's a, a good skill to have. And then here she is taking x-rays on a cat for a dentistry. We take x-rays on every single patient. They get every single tooth x-rayed. This is Dr. Lund, the previous owner of City Kitty, pulling some teeth on a kitty and having so much fun. <laughs> and then here's regular surgery prep. This cat was gonna get spayed. So the technician is preparing the cat, the doctor gets scrubbed in and gets gowned up and everything. And here she is doing the spay. So we also see appointments starting around nine o'clock in the morning. And as the morning goes on in between surgeries and drop-offs and appointments, I make phone calls to owners to check on their cats and go over their blood test results. It's a lot of multitasking in veterinary hospitals. You, you can't always just sit down and have your undivided attention on one task. So there's a lot of, a lot of multitasking that goes on. Um, our surgeries usually finish at about noon, sometimes later, depending on the day. And then after that, we just continue seeing appointments until the end of the day. The vast majority of appointments that we see are sick visits. We do see plenty of healthy wellness visits, but being feline exclusive, we see much less than practices that see dogs. Unfortunately, cats are taken to the vet much less than dogs. So often the only times they're brought in are for their kitten visits for vaccines, maybe uh, spaying and neutering, and then not again until they are pretty critically ill. Not all of our patients are excited to be at our practice. <laughs> uh, here's a kitty getting shaved. Another one on the exam table. <laughs> So the diseases that we treat on a regular basis definitely vary compared to dogs. So the most common things that we see are hyperthyroidism, which is overactive thyroid disease, chronic kidney disease, so, so commonly, diabetes, um, IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease or, or other gastrointestinal disorders, cancer, lots and lots of cancer, many different types of cancer, unfortunately, but we do see a, a lot of cancer. Um, heart disease, mostly um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common type. We see foreign body ingestion or GI obstructions, which with cats are often involving linear things like strings, ribbons, thread, dental floss that they end up ingesting that cause a, a blockage in the intestines. But also I've removed all kinds of other things like 
Nerf gun um, bullets and uh, yoga mat foam and earplugs and even somebody's underwear one time, all kinds of things. Uh, a lot of dental disease uh, that we see in cats and then also quite a fair amount of allergies, lower urinary tract disease and a lot of behavior problems which usually look like issues with using the litter box or cats that are aggressive to either other cats in the house, dogs in the house or unfortunately people in the house. So what makes feline practice interesting? Well, cats are masters of hiding signs of illness. As predators, they are hardwired not to show any signs of weakness. They're also very independent creatures. It makes it really challenging for owners to catch on to the subtle signs of illness that are often present before the cat becomes really ill. Many cat owners are just not educated or observant enough to see that their cat is acting just a little bit different or that there's been a very slight change in their routine. Unfortunately, that means that by the time the owners do realize, it's often extremely sick. We have patients come in that have lost 50% of their body weight, are 10% or more dehydrated, or have been vomiting every time they eat a meal for the past three days, or haven't moved at all in days. And often the owners tell us, I swear he was totally fine until two days ago. This presents a huge challenge for us as veterinarians. We end up treating way more critically ill patients than we should just because they were not brought in sooner. I'm not sure how many of you have spent time in a veterinary practice or a hospital. I figured I would spend a little time explaining how an appointment for a sick cat might work in our hospital. Um, so when an owner comes in with their pet, they're greeted and they come in the door and they are checked in by our cat concierges, which is otherwise known to everybody else as receptionists. Um, and then once a room is available, they are escorted to the room and instructed that they can open the cat carrier and let their kitty explore if it chooses. We try not to force them out. So we try to give them the option and give them time to get comfortable in that room and decide that they do want to come out on their own. Um, the, the record then is taken by a technician who reviews it and checks in the computer to see why the cat is being brought in that day. If it's a cat that's been seen by us previously, they check and see if it's due for anything like blood work, urine testing, vaccines, or anything else. If the cat has never been seen at City Kitty, then the technician will review the previous records uh, just briefly, and then they'll go into the room and take a, his a history. They ask basic questions such as, why is Fluffy here today? How long has she been sick? Is she doing any coughing, any sneezing, any vomiting, any diarrhea? Is she on any medications? If so, which ones, how much, how long? Uh, all of those sorts of questions. And then after they get the history, the technician brings the record to myself or one of the other doctors and explains what's going on. While we review the record, the technician will collect a weight and a temperature on the cat. Weighing cats is critical. Sometimes it's the only way that we know that they're sick. They might be acting completely fine as far as the owner can tell, but then we weigh them and find out that they've lost two pounds, which is a lot for a cat. So every cat that puts even a paw into City Kitty gets weighed. And then the doctor goes into the exam room and speaks to the owner. We review the history and fill in any gaps or additional questions that we find pertinent. When it's time to examine the cat, the technician gently restrains for us. Cats are animals that require consent. They do not like to be forced to do things they don't wanna do or to be touched or handled when they don't wanna be. Because of this, we need to be extremely respectful of how we handle and restrain them, especially in the hospital where they're already very, very upset and on edge. We use, utilize kinder, kinder and gentler restraint techniques. We don't scruff cats, we don't pin them down, we don't handle them roughly ever. Believe it or not, most cats will tolerate much more than you might think if they're handled correctly and appropriately. Be like, being a feline only practice, our technicians are masters at this. They're experts at reading feline body language, and know how to move their hands and touch the cats in just the right way to make them feel secure and comfortable. It's not to say that it goes smoothly with every patient. Sometimes even with all the gentlest handling in the world, things go south that our patients do not consent. In that situation, we'll, we will use leather gloves for protection, or if that fails, we will sedate the cats. Our job is to be able to do a thorough physical exam on each and every patient. We can tell so much about their health and what may or may not be going on just by a good thorough exam. Therefore, if that can't happen, we strongly feel that it's better to go ahead and sedate the patient rather than send them home because everybody knows they do not want to come back again another day. So here's some of our technicians gently restraining this cat. We do have a muzzle on so that nobody is getting, um, will get bit, but they're not scruffing it. They're just gently having it be on its side there and 
getting that toenails trimmed. And here's two of our technicians. You can see the one has the leather gloves on and she's got a kitty all wrapped up in some towels gently and is carrying it out um, so that it's not, not scared, but also can't hurt anybody. So after our exam, we give the kitty a little break and we have a discussion with the owner about what we think is going on with their cat. Uh, the doctor recommends a treatment plan for the day. And then we step out with the technician and the technician makes an estimate for the client and reviews it with them. And then after we get permission to do um, the treatment plan, um, then the technician brings the cat to our treatment room where the patient is treated. This might include a series of diagnostic tests like blood work, urinalysis, radiographs, blood pressure, or other things. We'll, all, um, we'll also usually give the patient some treatment while it's at City Kitty to try to make it feel better. So maybe some fluids or other injections to make it feel better. This is our treatment room. This is where all the action happens. We've got a couple of tables and that's where cats that are needing um, any diagnostics done or treatments given, they come back here. Just more, more treatments and action happening with the cats. Cats are notoriously hard to medicate. We know this. Therefore, we try to give the cats everything we can while they are in our practice, knowing that the chances of the owner being able to give them medication at home is very, very slim. So we do everything we can to get them feeling better before they walk out or are carried out the door. Um, after the patient has had the test done and the treatment's given, it's brought back to the room and the doctor goes back in and we review the findings with the owner, the plan of action and the follow-up plan. Then the technician will go in and go over any medications being sent home and then take the payment for the visit. So we, being in a cat practice, once again, if we are sending home medication, we try to make it as easy as possible on the owners. So this in the picture here is a liquid medication. We get them flavored, tuna flavored or chicken flavored so that hopefully the cats will be more likely to wanna eat it in the food. We also get a lot of transdermal medications, which means it's made into an ointment, like a cream that you actually just wipe on the inside of the ear and it gets absorbed through the skin so that the owner doesn't have to give anything by mouth to the cat. So that's a, a typical visit at City Kitty and a little bit about what I do specifically. Yeah, that was super interesting. I've already learned a lot about um, your work at City Kitty and like a full walkthrough of your day. Um, and I also really love cats. And so this is really exciting to hear. Because they're the best. <laughs> yeah, they're the best. Um, so now I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your education and training that prepared you for this career, how it helped you, what were the prerequisites, where did you study, and if you had any influential mentors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so about my, my training and education. So I grew up in Southern California and I went to UC Santa Barbara. I thought I wanted to be a human doctor, a physician. So I started out at, as a pre-med track and then somewhere along the way decided that maybe that wasn't for me. So I started exploring options and ended up landing on veterinary medicine. But I was already enrolled at UC Santa Barbara and they did not have any kind of animal science degree. So I decided that I would major in zoology, which wasn't really anything close to animal science, I found out later. <laughs> but I did get a, a bachelor's of science in zoology uh, from UC Santa Barbara. And then after I graduated, I started, like I spoke about earlier, I started working as a veterinary technician. And that fall, I applied to veterinary school. I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I didn't really have anyone mentoring me in the process. And um, I had letters of recommendation, but I had to write them myself. And the doctor said, oh, I'll just sign it for you. So I, I really didn't have a lot of great mentorship in the process. And long story short, I applied. I ended up getting waitlisted at Purdue, but I did not get in. And I was crushed. I was discouraged. I thought veterinary medicine wasn't for me. I kept working as a vet tech, but I also started substitute teaching. My entire family are all teachers, um, and I thought maybe that should be my path as well. My sister's a teacher, my parents are both teachers, my grandma was a teacher, my aunts are teachers, everybody. Um, but the next fall rolled around and I still decided, nope, I don't wanna apply. So I didn't apply that year. And then after a lot of encouragement from my family and friends, I rethought my decision. And what I did was I called some of the schools that had rejected me the first time and I asked what I could do differently to make my application stronger. They told me to 
continue getting more experience and see if I could increase my GRE scores. Um, that's the graduate, I think it's graduate record exam. Um, so I enrolled in a GRE prep course and I kept working as a vet tech. And I also took a few additional courses at other colleges so that I could apply to more schools that had prereqs that I hadn't already taken, including UC Davis, which I had not applied to the first time around. At that point in time, at least there were, you know, every school had different prerequisites. So I applied to the ones that I had the prereqs for, but this, these additional courses allowed me to be able to apply to even more schools. So that fall I reapplied and I'm pretty sure I applied to 12 vet schools and I went on interviews and I ended up getting accepted at 10 schools. And in all honesty, not a whole lot changed with my application. I, my GRE scores were a little higher and I did get A's in all the additional courses that I took, but I don't think it really changed my overall GPA too much. I think that what made the difference was that I proved that I really wanted to be a veterinarian and that I had the drive. I think I also interviewed pretty well. And the first time I applied, I only went on one interview and that was the school where I got waitlisted. So I, I don't know for sure, but that's, that's my working theory. Um, so I have strong advice to those of you that are in the process of applying or giving some thought to applying down the road. Be persistent, don't give up. If this is the path you wanna take, then do everything in your power to make it happen. Uh, I did have a classmate at Minnesota who had applied 10 times before she got in and then she finally got in. So if it is what you really want to do, you really have to persevere and, and keep trying and not give up. Yeah, that is a really good advice. And um, yeah, that was really interesting, helpful to understand. And now could you discuss, um, I know you touched on this a little bit before, but could you discuss about how your career has evolved over time, including skills and experience that you learned during your fascinating journey, the best career decision you made, any setbacks that turned out to be an advantage, and any considerations as you made different choices during your career? Yeah, um, so I, I, I'm gonna say this, when, well, <laughs> I think I, I kind of touched on the setbacks and I think I think that's really the most important thing that I ever did was was to just really push through it and, and persevere. Um, and I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And deep down in my mind, I knew that all along. And I, you know, I, I wasn't used to failing. And I think that's probably the case for most people that are listening to this recording is you're probably all really good students. I suspect most of you have not failed too much and you've all done really well in school and everything else that you've chose to pursue along the way. And I think it's it's hard to get, get a rejection like that. And it, it's if this is really what you wanna do and this really really is kind of your, your dream, I, I hate to say that word, that was a word that people threw at me all the time during that process and I started to hate that word. But if it really is truly your dream and you really can't imagine yourself doing anything else, then you really do have to persevere and you, you have to do your do the work and put in the effort and, and find out what can make you a better applicant and, and keep trying. Um, because once you're in and, and once you get through the process, then it, it's not that it's easy, but that's that's 90 percent of it is it's just that application and, and getting into school. So. Yeah, that was really helpful. Um, may I ask, what are some of the most rewarding aspects of your career? Um, sorry, I think my, my slideshow might just be a little bit off here, but let me just see. I'm gonna just just go through this part because I have this slide, and then I'll I'll touch on that if that's okay. Um, just a little bit more advice that I had. So, um, a few th more things that I just want to say is that when you do go into vet school, I I really highly recommend going into it with an open mind, even if you're absolutely sure about what facet of veterinary medicine you want to enter. I really really encourage you to keep yourself open to all possibilities. It may be that you just haven't yet been exposed to the area of veterinary medicine that'll be your perfect fit. So um, as I said earlier, it became clear to me when I was in vet school that I really wanted to specialize in just cats. 
I not only really loved cats, but I really loved feline medicine. And for me, feeling confident enough about this choice to go straight into feline only practice was the best decision I could have made. I immediately started gaining experience in my field of choice. I started at a very busy practice where from day one, I was seeing lots of complicated cases and doing almost all of the surgeries that they had every day. The hours were really long and grueling, but I'm so thankful for that first year. I learned and got to do so much and it made me a much more confident vet than I likely would have been in a slower practice or one with um, less mentorship. Um, so did you ask about the career evolution? <laughs> I apologize um, out of alignment here. Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, I can talk about that and then I have a, a couple a couple other slides on it. But um, so I, I think I, I did talk a little bit about it, but um, these were kind of the steps that I took toward becoming a veterinarian and then eventually to being a practice owner. So each of you will have your own unique path. Um, for me, I've been feline exclusive for almost 15 years. And then two years ago, I had the opportunity to become a practice owner. And this was absolutely the best decision I could have made. Owning a veterinary practice is not easy. Um, in addition to the responsibilities of taking care of patients every day, you're also responsible for overseeing the management of the practice and the business itself and all of the staff that work for you. It's not an easy job, but it's extremely rewarding to be able to provide an environment where we can all work together cohesively as a team and we take care of our patients and their owners and each other. Um, I think the single best thing about being a vet is helping to strengthen the human animal bond. People absolutely adore their cats and all of their pets, and many consider them to be members of the family. It's scary and stressful when a pet is sick and you don't know what's wrong or how to help it. I can't tell you how good it feels to be able to help these sick, sometimes incredibly sick patients get better and to see the joy that it brings their owner to have their pet well again. And so I think that you know is really the, the best part of all and, and why we all go into this field. Just a few more, more slides here. Um, another part of being a vet that I absolutely cherish is getting to see the people that I work with grow and learn every day, every single day. And that includes myself. Um, over the course of my 20, over 20 years in this field, I've seen high school students start as kennel assistants and then become a lead surgical tech. I've seen college students come to volunteer a few hours a week and then get into veterinary school and go on to do internships and residencies. I've seen folks start out as an entry level veterinary assistant and then become a veterinary technician and then a practice manager. It's so rewarding to see people doing what they love and continuing to progress and develop their skill and knowledge base to succeed in the field. A couple of our technicians at City Kitty. Okay. Yes, those are some very good points that you have pointed out. And um, I was wondering, I know you touched on this a little bit before, but if you want to tell me about what students can do in order to prepare to become a vet. Sure. Um, well, I had a few things, if it's okay, if we can um, just talk about how the profession has changed. Is that okay? We'll talk about that first, okay. Um, so I just had a, a, a few points to talk about just what I've seen as far as the profession and how it's changed. Um, so this first one here, it's something that's been gradually happening over maybe the last 50 years, honestly. So when I was in school in the early 2000s, this was already very much the case. We had a class, I think of about a hundred students and I think of the hundred, only 12 were male. <laughs> And as time goes on, we're seeing the previous generation of veterinarians start to retire now. And the profession as a whole is now becoming majority female, which is, is pretty interesting. Um, another major change that we're seeing in veterinary medicine is that more and more practices are now being purchased by corporations. And there are many different corporate consolidators out there, but some that are, are really actually very large. And some of the bigger ones that maybe you've heard of are VCA, NVA, VetCor, Blue Pearl, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but there's a large percentage of veterinary practices that are privately owned by veterinarians that are at or near retirement age. 
And these corporate consolidators are able to make offers to these practice owners that are exponentially higher than what they would be typically valued at. And that then any individual person would be able to pay if they wanted to buy the practice. So this is why we're seeing the percentage of, of corporate owned hospitals continue to increase each year. So that's a big one. Um, and then the last one is, um, you know, not, not super fun to talk about, but it's, it's reality. And uh, veterinary medicine isn't easy. It comes with a high price tag, both literally and figuratively. The average student loan amount currently for students graduating from veterinary school is close to $200,000. I'm going to say that again, $200,000. And that's the average. So many students are graduating with much higher debt burdens, especially if they start vet school with previous debt from their undergraduate education. It's something that you really need to think about before deciding to be a veterinarian. Um, it's not to say that you shouldn't do it, but I, it just, it really needs to be given serious thought. The debt can be crippling for some and the loan payments after graduating are often higher than many starting vets are able to pay. Some students, especially international students also take out loans from private lenders, which often have really high interest rates, which are way higher than the Department of Education loans. There are certainly workarounds, mostly the income-based repayment or IVR plans that have been how the vast majority of these, these students and now veterinarians with extremely high debt loads have been able to manage their loan payments. Um, and the other part of the statement is the issues that veterinarians face with mental health and burnout, um, et cetera. Being a vet is not easy. It's a tough job that can be emotionally and physically taxing. We witness a lot of pain and suffering and we aren't always able to fix it, which for so many of us is really hard to cope with. We work long hours and we're not paid as well as our counterparts in human medicine. And now more than ever, we have clients that can be extremely difficult and demanding and are very quick to jump online and, and blast you if you, they've had a bad experience or perceive that you did not do the right thing in any given situation with their pet. And then on top of this, with the majority of this field now being women, uh, many of us are trying to juggle the struggles of being a veterinarian with also having children and being a parent. Um, it's not easy, period, it's not. And I know personally, it's been hard for me. I always feel like I'm not giving 100% to my job or my children. And that's because the fact is that you can't, you can't give 100% to both. So it's a delicate balancing act and we all just have to do the best we can. Yeah, so now um, that was really good advice and that was really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So now we can kind of um, dive into what students can do in order to prepare to become a vet. Sure. Um, so I've, I've got a few of my points of advice here on the screen. There's, there's much more. Um, the first one though, unfortunately, grades are important. Grades and sometimes GRE scores are how the vast majority of schools make their initial cuts in the applicant pool. Um, most schools look at both your cumulative GPA as well as your GPA in just the science or prerequisite courses. Um, from there, they make a big cut, and then they consider all of the other factors in the, stu in the students that have the highest GPAs. Um, GRE is starting to become a thing of the past. I know right now, I think it's probably, maybe it's half and half. Half schools are requiring it, and half the schools have done away with that requirement. Um, so it, it really will kind of just depend on where you're applying and, and what the time frame is. Um, the next one is experience, which is extremely important. And it's important for you to get experience and really gain an understanding of what's involved in the field and whether or not it's really something that you wanna do, but also for your vet school application. Schools wanna see that you've put in the time and effort to explore veterinary medicine and that you have a firm grasp on what it's all about. It's not enough really just to love animals. Now more than ever, vet schools are looking for students that are diverse, um, that are well-rounded or are non-traditional students. And this can include veterinary medicine as a second career, majoring in something completely unrelated to veterinary medicine, you know, all, all kinds of different things that fall into that category. Any variety of experience that you can get, even if it's not veterinary related, has potential to benefit you on your vet school application. 
Um, make sure that you're aware of the many roles that veterinarians can serve or the career paths that are available. The majority of veterinarians go into private practice. However, there are so many more opportunities available if you should so choose. Other examples can include the public health sector, federal government, the US Army or Air Force, food supply medicine, research, shelter medicine, global veterinary medicine. There, there's so many different things other than private practice. If you do happen to have uh, an interest in pursuing one of these less common sectors, it will likely give you an advantage when applying and help you stand out. When you do apply to vet school, be sure to demonstrate what makes you unique and different from the rest of the applicants. Veterinary schools receive hundreds of applications each year, some of them even over a thousand. You need to stand out. It's your time to brag and show what unique experiences or backgrounds you bring to the table that will help make you a great veterinarian. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes, that is some great advice and that was very helpful. Um, what do you think are some of the factors to consider when choosing a vet school? So from a financial standpoint, the best school to go to is the school in the state in which you live, hands down. This allows you to pay the resident tuition, which is considerably less than non-resident. A few states have more than one vet school, just a few. Many states have one vet school, many states have none. If you live in a state without a vet school, then there's likely a contract between your home state and one or more vet schools in neighboring states to assist you. Sometimes this means a certain number of seats are reserved for students from your state, or sometimes there's a program in place where the first two years of school are done at a school in your home state without a full-fledged veterinary medicine program, and then you transfer to a vet school in a neighboring state for the second two years. These are called two plus two programs, and um, there's more and more states that are doing this. Um, some that I know of are Idaho, South Dakota, Alaska, and Nebraska. They all have two plus two programs, but I think there's more. But if you're considering choosing a school that is not in your home state, then I will highly encourage you to look into whether that state has an option for out-of-state students to become residents. This was the case for me. I opted not to go to UC Davis where I would have paid resident tuition. And instead I chose the University of Minnesota, which meant that I would be paying much more in tuition. However, Minnesota had a program in place where a student could attain residency after a year of being in the program, if you were also employed simultaneously um, somewhere in the state. So I worked part-time as a vet tech throughout vet school, and that allowed me to become a Minnesota resident and pay resident tuition for three out of the four years, which saved me literally tens of thousands of dollars. So if you are considering a school that's not in your state, please do your research and look into whether schools um, that you are considering have a residency option. I do think that those are starting to go away. A lot of schools are getting rid of that. So they, there may not be too many that still allow that at this point. Um, so when you're considering a school, I also encourage you to take a detailed look at their curriculum. When I was looking at veterinary schools and I went on interviews, I was especially, especially impressed with Minnesota for many reasons. Uh, the main thing that I liked was that the students received hands-on training with animals starting day one. And that was extremely important to me. At some of the other schools that I looked at and interviewed at, students didn't even touch an animal until their third year. Uh, I also wanted to make sure I got a good amount of surgical experience on actual real live animals as opposed to cadavers or animal models. Students start performing surgeries their third year at Minnesota and do not just spays and neuters, but they do gastrotomies, intestinal resection and anastomoses, cystotomies, all kinds of other things. And um, it's also important to think about whether you might be interested in small animal or large animal or zoo animal or public health or whatever. You may not know yet. And as I talked about earlier, that's totally fine. But if you have a strong feeling that maybe you're never gonna be touching a cow, then you may wanna look at the small animal caseload of the school that you're applying to and see you know, who has a higher caseload in their small animal hospital. And, but same thing if you are wanting to focus on large animal or production manager or produ production animal or whatever. Uh, a few other things to think about, some schools have tracking and this means that the students make a decision about what type of medicine interests them like small animal, food animal, equine, and then they take courses and rotations that help them gain more experience in those areas. Usually tracking happens in the second half of the curriculum after everyone has already taken the basic science and diseased animal classes. 
for me, I really liked being in a school that tracked as I didn't have to spend time in my fourth year doing equine internal medicine and large animal surgery or other rotations that wouldn't pertain to my specific career path. Uh, but many schools do not do that. So it's just something to look into. Uh, another big thing to look into is whether a school has a teaching hospital or uses a distributed model for students during their clinical year. This is pretty important. So most of the older what, what's called land grant schools that have been around for a long time have teaching hospitals on campus. And in a teaching hospital, almost all of your core, meaning required rotations, which are usually during your fourth year, are done on site with specialists that work at the vet school. And then your elective rotations, or they're called externships, are done at private practices or other places of your choosing. And there's usually a handful of those. The newer veterinary schools that have opened do not have teaching hospitals. So they use what's called a distributive model, which means that students are sent out to other referral hospitals, private practices, teaching hospitals to do their core clinical rotations as well as their externships. Neither one of these is better than the other. There are pros and cons to both, uh, but I encourage you to look into this and give it some thought as it can result in two very different vet school experiences, especially during your fourth year. So just really something to think about especially now more than ever, there's a lot um, of newer veterinary schools that have, have opened or are in the process of opening and they are all using the distributed model. Um, you may wanna give some consideration to the location of the schools in which you're looking. Many schools have an agricultural emphasis for undergrads too, and are therefore located in smaller, more rural towns or cities. A few schools are located right in the middle of, of pretty big cities such as Minnesota and Penn and a couple others. Some schools are located a long way from an airport or at least far from a major airport. And if you're going out of state, that might be important. Location shouldn't be your most important consideration, but it should be something that you at least look into. And you might also wanna explore what sorts of programs um, like extracurricular experiences, additional degree options, et cetera, that are offered at a particular school. There's so many examples of this. Um, personally speaking, at Minnesota, we were able to apply for a scholarship to travel to China and South Korea one summer to study traditional Chinese medicine, particularly acupuncture, and our entire month-long trip was paid for. It was such an incredible experience. I had classmates that also went on RAVS trips, and RAVS stands for Rural Area Veterinary Services, and the, this involved students traveling to remote areas where residents often didn't have access to basic veterinary care. And they were able to participate in spaying and neutering of pets and provide other basic medical services. Everybody that went on those trips, I never did one, but they all loved them and they got great surgical experience and really got to participate in hands-on veterinary medicine the entire time. Uh, our school also had a really strong dual DVM MPH, which is a master's of public health program. And we had often 15 or 20 people in each class that would enroll in that program. So just these are all things to think about when you're trying to decide what school to apply to um, and then hopefully which school to attend if you have some choices. Keep in mind, um, I will say every school in the United States and Canada is accredited by the AVMA. And that means that they have met a set of 11 standards put in place by the AVMA to, to ensure that every student graduates competent to start working as a veterinarian from day one. There's a lot of other international schools that are also AVMA accredited. If a school is not accredited, it doesn't mean that it's not good, but the steps to be able to work in the United States are much more involved. So I just encourage you to do your research and give it a lot of thought before deciding to go to a school that is not AVMA accredited. Okay, thank you so much for chatting with me today and sharing uh, a ton of useful information. I've learned so much. Um, you have such a rewarding career, and I wish you continued success. Thank you, and I just want to say thank you so much for putting this presentation together. It's been such an honor to be able to speak to you. Um, I really wish all of you the best in your, um, your career progress going through the application and interviews and hopefully getting into school and getting through school and choosing your career. Um, this is such a great idea, Isha. I'm, I'm so impressed that you have put all of this together. Um, I did put my contact information here. So if anybody did have any questions or want to contact me, feel free to. Um, and of course, I had to include a couple pictures of my, my precious cats here. These are my personal cats. <laughs> 
and my other one, that's Thomas, and this is William. So thank you, Esha, and I hope one day to call all, all of you guys my colleagues.